Okay, a very good morning to everybody and a warm welcome to the live webinar on Brain Tumors Explained, conducted by Lanka Hospitals. The webinar is organized to commemorate World Brain Tumor Day, which fell on the 8th of June. Due to the pandemic, we have had to reschedule it for today. The focus of the webinar is to create an increased awareness regarding the early signs and symptoms of brain tumors, thereby leading to an early diagnosis of the disease, which in turn will improve the overall outcome of treatment, whether it be surgical or non-surgical. We will also be looking at the various modalities that are used for the successful diagnosis of brain tumors. When a patient is diagnosed with a brain tumor, it puts a whole lot of anxiety on the patient as well as the whole family who might feel helpless with a whole lot of questions and very few answers available to them at very short notice. Through this webinar, hopefully, these patients and their families will be able to find answers to some of their burning unanswered questions. And in doing so, shed evidence-based clarity on their outcomes. A dedicated neurosurgical theater equipped with a neuromicroscope, neuronavigation system, uh, 3D CM and 32 channel nerve monitoring system to, together with the latest surgical equipment. We also have at our disposal a three Tesla MRI, CT, and neurophysiology unit together with a team of radiologists around the clock for accurate and precise diagnosis of conditions. We also have highly trained neurosurgeons on call 24-7, 365, who work as a team with anesthetists, pathologists, radiologists, and oncologists. The care of patients at the Neurosurgical Center at Lanka Hospitals is brought to a whole new dimension by well-trained and passionate staff in the wards as well as intensive care units and also in the high dependence units. Let me introduce now to the, the distinguished panel of speakers that will be on the forum. Dr. Ruini Abegunaratna, consultant neurosurgeon, Lanka Hospital, Colombo and Royal Salford NHS Trust from the United Kingdom. Dr. Sachini Malaviara Chirasnayaka, consultant oncologist. Dr. Srikant Srinivasan, consultant neurologist. And Dr. Eranga Ganevatta, consultant interventional radiologist. What you, Dr. Abhikara. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody um, to this webinar today. Um, unfortunately, um, because of the COVID situation, we were unable to carry out the traditional way of um, having a conference with regards to this. But hopefully, if technology works appropriately, we should be able to get the message across anyway. I'd like to go through the agenda for today without uh, any further delay. Um, and this is what we have. And for you today. So we'll have, a, uh, that was Dr. Jeevan Adialvis who gave us the introduction. And we'll be um, kicking off the meeting with Dr. Srikant Srinivasan, who will be going into in detail of the clinical manifestations and how patients present with tumors followed up by uh, Dr. Eranga Ganevatta, who will show us some pictures and uh, how a diagnosis can be made. We will follow that with um, a short break during which we will have a couple of testimonials, one in Sinhala and English of a patient experience. And after that, we'll be starting off with myself going through the surgical aspects of uh, tumor management, followed by Dr. Sachini Malaviarachi who uh, will go through the oncological um, uh, treatment and management of patients. We are going to have, as we cannot have everyone asking questions throughout the presentations, we will try and respond at the end with a question and answer 
uh, session. So if you'd like to type your questions in through the chat, uh, we'll try and cover as many as possible, uh, time permitting. And we will hope to end around 12.30 and we will have the information of how you can contact us and also um, uh, if there are any questions with regards to the presentations or if you would like some of the presentations, just let us know and we'll try and make that available to you. So I would like to start off now by introducing our first speaker, who is Dr. Srikant Srinivasan, um, who is our senior uh, neurologist at Lanka Hospital, to uh, start off with his uh, talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rubini. Uh, uh, we, yes. We're going to start uh, uh, today's presentation with uh, 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 clinical manifestations of uh, 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 brain tumors. So uh, I'll start off with the clinical presentations. So <clears throat> I've outlined this lecture into four uh, parts. So the first part of the lecture would be on the epidemiology. Epidemiology means uh, the uh, prevalence, the uh, uh, burden of brain tumors in the population and what are the risk factors for brain tumors. The second part, the bulk of the talk will be on the clinical features of brain tumors, including both the primary brain tumors as well as the metastatic brain tumors, those brain tumors uh, uh, which uh, uh, are the secondary deposits from uh, uh, other tumors from other organs in the body. Uh, 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 there'll be a very brief uh, uh, slide on the investigations, uh, the non-radiological investigations of brain tumors, because radiology will be spoken about in detail by Dr. Erega Ganevata later. I will also briefly deal with the management of seizures, because seizures are a very important part of uh, brain tumor management, and also be briefly touching upon the management of seizures and brain tumors. So talking about brain tumors, what are the rates of brain tumors in the general population and what is the morbidity that is caused upon by these brain tumors? Even though brain tumors are not a very common uh, 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 kind of tumor that we encounter in the general population, they account for only about 2% of all malignant cancers in adults, but they are uh, uh, much more common in children, accounting for about 20% of all malignant cancers in children they have a very high case fatality ratio. That's why studying brain tumors is very important because the case fatality ratio is almost close to 25%, which is second only to about uh, strokes in the general adult population. That is why studying brain tumors is very important, even though on the whole, they might not be a very common kind of cancer that we encounter in the general adult population. So the five-year survival rate of primary malignant brain tumor, cancerous kind of brain tumors, is about uh, uh, only about 30 to 35 percent, even though uh, treatment methods are advancing uh, rapidly in, in the current era. And the general factors, the major factors that influence survival in brain tumors are the age of the patient. Younger patients have a better survival. The location of tumor also uh, plays a major part in uh, 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 predicating survival. The grade of the tumor, the more malignant, the more cancerous the tumor, the uh, lesser the chances of survival. The particular type of tumor, there are many different types of tumor which uh, Dr. Rubini will be uh, uh, talking about. Those also play a, a big part in determining whether the uh, rates of survival will also uh, be impacted upon. So coming to the risk factors, there are very few risk factors that have been conclusively shown uh, 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 to have an association with development of brain tumors. So the only two risk factors that have been defin definitively shown to have an association with development of brain tumors, the, uh, the most important ones are ionizing radiation and genetic factor. So ionizing radiation as a nuclear radiation. So what has been shown is that ionizing radiation that occurs as part of nuclear radiation or as part of therapeutic cranial uh, uh, irradiation have been definitively shown to have uh, 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 to predispose to development of uh, brain tumors later. So genetic factors, even though they are very, very rare as a causative uh, risk factor in brain tumors, they do play a, a very uh, minor role in the development of brain tumors in certain syndromes, neurocutaneous syndromes, for example, 
There are certain neurocutaneous syndromes that cause certain skin lesions as well as multiple tumors and brains in other parts, organs of the body. So there are certain symptoms, syndromes such as neurofibromatosis, tuberous sclerosis, von heffel lindorf syndrome, as well as Cowden's disease. So in these particular uh, special syndromes, there is a, a greater predisposition for the development of brain tumors. So of course, the hottest topic that is being uh, very often debated is with the mobile phone usage, heavy usage of cell phones is a risk factor for the development of uh, uh, brain tumors later. But all studies of uh, to date have been, uh, 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 what have they, they've shown is that they've not, they've not conclusively proven an association with the development of brain tumors. So as of uh, today, the jury is out. What we can uh, safely say is that Mobile phone usage to the uh, uh, normal extent that we all use is not a proven risk factor for the development of brain tumors. Of course, like everything else, moderate mobile phone usage is not a, 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 a risk factor for mobile uh, brain tumor development. Of course, excessive mobile phone usage has not been uh, uh, conclusively determined. So we really do not know whether excessive mobile phone usage is a risk factor for development, but moderate cell phone usage, as we all do in the general population now, is definitely not a risk factor for the later development of brain tumor. So the clinical features of brain tumors, which forms the bulk of today's lecture, can be divided into generalized clinical features as well as focal clinical features. So generalized clinical features are uh, headaches, nausea, vomiting, cognitive and behavioral changes are uh, those changes that impact upon uh, uh, the higher intellectual functions of the brain, as well as syncope, which is blackouts that result from brain tumors. So we will deal with each one of these in uh, uh, sufficient detail. The focal uh, 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 clinical features of uh, 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 brain tumors which result from the actual location or the invasion of the brain tumor on a particular region of the brain where they are situated, are seizures, focal motor changes, language difficulties or aphasia, visual impairments, and cranial nerve impairments. These are the focal uh, uh, changes that happen due to brain tumors. So coming to the uh, one of the most uh, common uh, generalized clinical feature of brain tumors, headache accounts for almost 50 to 70% of uh, the generalized uh, uh, clinical feature in most patients with brain tumors, especially the malignant or the cancerous kind of brain tumors. The commonest kind of headache usually mimics a um, migraine or a tension type headache with tension type headache predominating, which means that it is a featureless headache. It's a bilateral headache occurring on both sides, usually in the front of the headache. With the, which is not very severe. It's a mild kind of headache. This is the commonest kind of headache that happens in most uh, uh, patients with uh, uh, brain tumors. Very rarely it can be migraines. Uh, the classic brain tumor headache that most, of do most doctors are taught about, the early morning headache that slowly reduces as the day passes, with nausea vomiting, with projectile vomiting, uh, that only happens in a minority of patients with brain tumors seen in only about 15% of patients. What is most specific to uh, 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 the headache that happens in brain tumors is that the headaches may worsen with valsalva maneuver, which happens is anything that increases the pressure within the brain, the head, like bending forward, coughing, sneezing, or any postural change, like getting up, bending down. If the headache worsens with any of these uh, 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 changes, then that is more specific to a headache caused by a brain tumor. So vomiting usually signifies that the intracranial pressure is increased due to a brain tumor. So it is mostly seen with posterior force of brain tumors. Posterior force means uh, the uh, tissues in the back of the head, the small brain, the cerebellum, and the brain stem. Usually seen in children, uh, because the posterior force of brain tumors are uh, more commonly seen in children. And this results in projectile vomiting. Vomiting as soon as the patient eats. It's called projectile vomiting. Uh, projectile vomiting means vomiting that happens without a warning sign uh, or a nausea preceding the vomiting. 
So it can also rarely be a seizure manifestation. For example, vomiting itself can be the sign of a fit. That's called a, 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 a seizure manifestation or a, a vomiting. So that happens in particular type of brain tumors happening in certain specific areas of the brain called the insula and the medial temporal lobes. So uh, what about the cognitive and behavioral changes? Those changes that affect the uh, higher intellectual functions and the behavior and the personality of a particular patient. These are also very commonly seen, seen in up to 30% of the patients with brain tumors. So the commonly seen personality changes are lack of initiative, the patient becomes lethargic, withdrawn, lacking in initiative. Or on the other hand, they might also become very disinhibited, irritable, uh, they become emotionally labile. By that, it means that the patient is not able to control his emotions. He alternates between laughter and crying. So usually this signify, these clinical features signify the involvement of the frontal lobes, the uh, brain, regions in the front of the brain. So they can also be rarely seen in gliomatosis and neoplastic meningitis. Gliomatosis is uh, a, a malignant form of brain cancer that invades the most regions of the brain. Uh, memory loss can also be seen in certain types of brain tumor. And the particular type of memory loss that is seen in brain tumors is a subcortical kind of brain tumor. By that I mean the patient is able to register and form new memories, but the patient has difficulty in recalling that particular type of form memories when the time comes for him to recall, remember those memories. This is called a subcortical type of memory loss. In fact, most of the types of, this is called a reversible type of dementia because these types of dementia resulting in memory loss can usually be reversed once you uh, operate these brain tumors. Uh, 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 I am a memory disorder specialist. Most of the types of reversible dementias that I've seen resulting from tumors is this particular type of subcortical type of uh, uh, dementias. So where the recall is more affected than in registration of new memories. Of course, syncope, which is blackouts, just blackouts without any jerky movements, uh, unlike a fit where you have loss of consciousness with jerky movements. This type of transient loss of consciousness or tone can also happen due to uh, brain tumors, but it's a very rare manifestation, usually seen in children with compression, brain tumors compressing the posterior fossa, structures in the back of the brain. Uh, uh, it can also ha happen in certain uh, particular type of tumors called colloid cyst or pineal tumors, so which got positional syncope, positional blackouts, for example, when the patient uh, uh, bends down or when the patient prostrates to uh, salute before somebody, that is the kind of uh, blackouts that happen in such kind of patients. Pituitary tumors, for example, uh, uh, the tumors that happen at the base of the brain, that can also cause blackouts due to adrenal insufficiency, hormonal insufficiency, resulting in low blood pressure. Cardiac rhythm abnormalities can also uh, cause, uh, result in blackouts in a particular type of tumor happening in the brain region called the insula, uh, 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 that can also result in syncope or blackouts. Uh, coming to the focal changes, changes affecting one particular region of the brain, the commonest of course is slowly progressive limb weakness affecting one side of the body. So this is more often seen in malignant cancerous tumors than in benign tumors, uh, 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 because uh, 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 there is a rapid progression and invasion of a particular region of the brain. So gradually progressive or rapidly progressive weakness affecting both the legs can also be seen. That happens in parasagittal men meningiomas. These particular tumors sit on top of the brain and they particularly affect the brain regions controlling power or uh, 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 motor power to both the legs. Sudden weakness, which mimics a stroke, can also be rarely seen in a brain tumors. If that particular presentation happens, that should alert us for a bleeding which has occurred into a tumor or uh, following a fit, because there can be a, a, a temporary weakness that has uh, uh, resulted following a fit, or a sudden increase in uh, intracranial pressure uh, resulting from a tumor and a herniation, a downward descent of the brain 
against the tentorium, against certain structures uh, in the brain. That can also be a, a, a reason for a sudden increase in the weakness following a brain tumor. Visual symptoms are very commonly seen in brain tumors. So double vision is very common. They, they, uh, they can either be due to compression of the uh, uh, sixth nerves that comes to the uh, uh, eyes. So they are most often due to, uh, 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 they are a false localizing sign. By a false localizing, localizing sign, I mean uh, uh, they are, they don't signify that the brain tumor is sitting in the eye nerves, but the brain tumor is in a remote region, but they, by virtue of increasing the intracranial pressure, they cause this, uh, the intracranial pressure then indirectly results in uh, uh, pressure on the six nerves, which causes the double vision. By also causing increased intracranial pressure and pressure on the second nerve or the uh, uh, nerves that control vision to the eye nerves, transient visual obscurations, transient momentary uh, bilateral uh, uh, vision loss can also happen due to increased intracranial pressure due to the brain uh, uh, tumors. Visual field defects can also, uh, various types of visual field defects can also result from brain tumors. So resulting from the tumors uh, arising from anyway, starting from the eye nerves uh, and coursing through uh, uh, to the back of the brain. So these visual defects can, offer, uh, can affect one particular eye or congruous regions of both eyes or incongruous regions of both eyes or one quadrant of the eyes. Any, cut, any particular type of uh, uh, visual field defect can result from a brain tumor. So this diagram illustrates the uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, visual field defects that can happen in any type of uh, uh, brain tumor. So the entire uh, gamut of visual field defects can happen uh, in brain tumors. Brain tumors, you must remember, uh, for the GPs that may be present here, it's the only type of uh, brain lesion that can result in any type of visual field defects, not even a stroke. Uh, even a cerebrovascular lesion uh, will not be, uh, be able to cause any particular, all the uh, types of visual field defects. It's only a brain tumor that can result in every kind of visual field effects that we have studied. So that's one point to keep in mind. Other cranial nerve symptoms that can result are unilateral hearing loss, sensory neural hearing loss, tinnitus, buzzing or ringing noise in the ears, vertigo, dizziness, rotatory dizziness can be seen in vestibular schwannomas, which are uh, tumors arising uh, from the hearing nerve, the eighth nerves. They can also rarely cause uh, uh, numbness or facial sensory loss uh, or facial weakness uh, uh, on that particular side. Of course, other cranial nerve signs can also happen in brainstem tumors, which are very common in children. So extrapyramidal symptoms, other than weakness, motor symptoms that can result in brain tumors are ataxia, incoordination or imbalance of the limbs can, or walking can happen in children which are seen in posterior fossa tumors, tumors affecting the back of the brain. So even very rarely you can have gait apraxia or Brunt's ataxia, which is frontal lobe ataxia, which happen in frontal lobe tumors, where there's no weakness, there's no incoordination, there's no rigidity, but still the patient might not be able to walk. This is the kind of uh, gait difficulties that can result in frontal lobe tumors. Very rarely tremors, involuntary tremors or Parkinsonian-like symptoms can also be seen in tumors occurring in the thalamic or basal ganglia. In the deep nuclei or the deep brain tissues, these symptoms can also result. So what are these speech and language defects that can result, in, result from brain tumors? These are the dominant inferior frontal or superior uh, uh, temporal tumors. So for example, in the front and the middle portions of the uh, uh, brain. So these cause a mixture of expressive and receptive aphasia, meaning the patient is also has difficulty in producing speech. He also has difficulty in understanding speech that is uh, presented to him. So why is it important to uh, understand the, uh, the presence of speech and language uh, uh, difficulties arising from tumors is that when there is a tumor sitting on the brain regions, it is very important that as much as the surrounding area is preserved so as to not to worsen 
the speech difficulties that are already present in a particular patient. So there is a particularly a, a different kind of surgery that is performed called the awake craniotomy with intraoperative cortical stimulation. This is also done by Dr. Ravini in our hospital. So this particular kind, not fully anesthetizing the patient and making him unconscious during neurosurgical operation, making the patient awake during surgery and stimulating the speech area and asking him to produce speech during the particular surgery so that as much of the speech area can be preserved so as not to result in permanent speech loss. This particular type of surgery is important in preserving language function during uh, brain tumor surgeries. This is a very important thing. So other particularly uh, relevant uh, higher cortical functions are apraxia, acalculia, uh, can also result in uh, tumors arising in particular speech areas. Visual agnosia, difficulty in visual recognition can also result from tumors happening in the posterior part, the back regions of the brain. So these are also certain other uh, uh, deficits of higher intellectual functions that can result from brain tumor. Very rare presentations are anosmia, loss of smell with certain inferior frontal tumors, endocrinological symptoms like acromegaly, coarsening of facial features, thickening and coarsening and enlargement of the hands and face and bones, Cushing syndrome, precocious puberty in boys with hypothalamic pineal gland tumors, diencephalic syndromes, emaciation, failure to thrive in children, all these can also result. Autonomic dysfunction can also result from pituitary and hypothalamic tumors. So finally, coming to neoplastic meningitis. Neoplastic meningitis is a disseminated invasion of the coverings of the brain, the leptomeninges, the thin layers which cover the brain can get uh, uh, inf uh, infiltrated with cancer cells arising from some of the organs like breast, lung, or skin cancers. So this is called leptomeningeal carcinomatosis or uh, uh, neoplastic meningitis. This carries a very high morbidity and mortality. So untreated, the survival is less than uh, 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 two to three months. So it presents with multifocal uh, brain and spine symptoms, neck, back pain, cranial and lower motor neuron uh, uh, weakness are the common presenting signs at different levels of the brain spine. These are the commonest symptoms of uh, neoplastic meningitis. In addition to these headaches, cognitive changes, great difficulties and urinary incontinence can also happen. Coming to a very important topic uh, 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 among the clinical presentation of brain tumors, seizures and brain tumors. Seizures and brain tumors can result either at diagnosis or as the illness progresses. They can either be focal seizures or generalized seizures. Seizures affecting one particular part, side of the body or generalized seizures. So if they increase in frequency or severity, once they are diagnosed, then they can signal tumor progression. They are very common in low-grade tumors, benign tumors than in malignant brain tumors. They need to be distinguished from syncopal episodes, blackouts, or just loss of tone and faults that result from increased intracranial pressure. They are more common in tumors involving the cortical regions, the superficial, the surface of the brain rather than deeper region tumors. And certain types of tumors have a much greater propensity to result in tumors than in certain other tumors. So glial and glioneural tumors are particularly epileptogenic. These are uh, what are listed here called the dysembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumors, ganglia gliomas, low-grade oligodendrogliomas, and the astrocytomas. So how do you manage these seizures happening in brain tumors? If a Patient with a brain tumor has never had a seizure. There is no indication for starting anticonvulsants. If a patient has had one seizure, then even one seizure is an indication to start anticonvulsants. For example, in a patient without a tumor who has had just one seizure, we don't start anticonvulsants after the first seizure itself. Whereas in a patient with a brain tumor, even if he has had just one seizure, that itself is an indication to start anticonvulsants without waiting for a second seizure. There are certain differences in the choice of medications that they give in a particular patient, in a patient with a seizure resulting from a brain tumor. Medications like levetiracetam, sodium valproate, lamotrigine, and lacosamide are preferred 
drugs of choice in seizures resulting from brain tumors, other, rather than drugs such as phenytoin and carbamazepine, because drugs like phenytoin, carbamazepine are enzyme inducers, okay? E enzyme inducers are drugs which cause changes in the uh, 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 hepatic enzyme uh, metabolizing system. And if a patient with brain tumor is also going to have uh, a chemotherapy with certain medications, there is a high likelihood that these anticonvulsant themselves are going to interfere with the metabolism and the efficacy of all these chemotherapeutic drugs. So that is why certain other drugs, especially these other drugs like levetiracetam, sodium alphate, lamotrigine, and lecosamide are nowadays preferred as anticonvulsants of choice. In addition to that, it is also uh, uh, been demonstrated that levetiracetam and valproate themselves enhance the efficacy of uh, chemotherapeutic agents. So that's why they are preferred as anticonvulsants in epilepsy resulting from brain tumors. Indefinite treatment is preferred in epilepsy resulting from brain tumors in patients who are not candidates for surgery. So withdrawal is not attempted. And uh, in a patient who has not had a fit, who is going in for surgery, Anticonvulsants are used only for a period of about two weeks after the surgery, after which we try attempt withdrawal of the anticonvulsant. So one last slide on uh, uh, the uh, other in non-radiological investigations, certain blood tests and CSF analysis are also used. Uh, what are these blood tests? Usually, uh, CSF blood tests usually are used in neoplastic meningitis to demonstrate the presence of cancer cells in the cerebrospinal fluid. So we do a lumbar puncture to do it. And uh, large volume lumbar punctures, sometimes repeated lumbar punctures are used to demonstrate uh, uh, malignant cells in the CSF. Uh, blood counts with the ESR are always done in a patient with the cancer. Uh, serum chemistry such as glucose, liver, and renal functions are used. We do infection screening with the appropriate blood, urine, and sputum cultures because uh, uh, any patient with the, uh, cancer is much prone to infections. It is also improper, uh, important so that uh, uh, if we see, decide to start them on chemotherapeutic agents, it's important that uh, we do a lot of infections. In a patient with pituitary and supracellular tumors, we do a basic pituitary function test panel, which includes the following hormonal uh, assays, including cortisol, pyroxene, TSH, prolactin, FSLH, estradiol, all the good handle hormones and the insulin-like growth factor because certain pituitary tumors can uh, secrete these hormones is very important. So these are the non-radiological uh, uh, tests that we do in certain pa uh, patients with uh, uh, pituitary tumors and supracellular tumors. So this is about the clinical manifestations and the non-radiological uh, uh, investigations in uh, 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 patients with uh, 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 brain tumors. I hope I've tried to ma make it as simple as possible. Uh, 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 so uh, the entire gamut of uh, neurological dysfunction can result from both primary as well as secondary brain tumors. So uh, I hope uh, uh, I've given a simplistic overview of the clinical manifestations of brain tumors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Srikant, for that very informative uh talk i we are going to ask for questions at the end of the uh the sessions so if there's anything that you urgently need answered please uh, message in the box and i would like to therefore move on to our next speaker dr ranga ganewatha to talk about the appearances of tumors on imaging thank you first of all let me thank uh, lanka hospital and uh, Dr. Rubini for inviting me for this lecture. And uh, considering the vast cross-section of the participants, I will try to run through some of the imaging findings, a uh, bit of history of radiology in brain imaging, and just to get through some uh, common brain tumor findings in uh, now these days practice with uh, novel imaging modalities. So uh, in brain tumor, how a radiologist can help uh, in diagnosis and management of the... There are a few main objectives of brain tumor imaging. First is to diagnose, just to diagnose whether it's a tumor at fat or it's just a something else in the brain which mimics a brain tumor. 
and if possible, try and gauge the histological rate, which will ultimately depend on the treatment reality and uh, what are the give the prognostic evaluation for the patient itself, uh, discussing the uh, tumor with the patient. And it also helps in the treatment planning, delineate the tumor extent and whether it's uh, where the tumor exactly is and to guide the surgeon and where the tumor perilational edema is also and uh, on treatment planning, especially in surgical as well as oncological planning. And then following all the treatment modalities, then it comes back to us for, for post-treatment follow-up, either it's post-surgical or post-radio chemotherapy, uh, just to see how the progression or the response of the treatment uh, following whatever the treatment modality has offered. So what is my basic job is to identify whether it's a tumor or whether it's just something else mimicking a brain tumor. If there's a tumor, whether it's malignant or benign. And then we will treat on the treatment plan, we will be guiding the surgeons to say which part of which is very active and which is tumorous and when you need to be irradiated if you're treating with radiation and if you're doing a biopsy, which part of the brain should be biopsies uh, to take a, a, a validated biopsy sample to represent the, whatever the tumor you are dealing with. And then of course, it will be coming back to us for the uh, follow-up just to see the, uh, how the treatment has offered, the patient has survived, whether the tumor has gone down in size or, and the effects of post-treatment changes in the brain as well. So to do is what are the uh, modalities we, uh, we have at hand? First of all, it's be the X-rays, which has been uh, in the past, we have been using it X-rays to diagnose brain tumors where we didn't have any cross-sectional imaging. Then it comes to invasive X-ray techniques like pneumocephalography, ventriculography, or conventional angiograms. This is again the pre-era of cross-sectional imaging. Then ultrasound, which is freely available, we mostly use in children uh, and during intraoperative to navigate ourselves to get to the tumor, and maybe a post-treatment uh, follow-up or doing intracranial Doppler studies to evaluate the the intracranial pressure situations. Then it comes to most uh, frequently used uh, CT imaging where you do contrast and non-contrast imaging just to get uh, what's happening in the brain, which will be a, a preliminary uh, diagnosis what's happening in the brain. And then you move into the MR, basic MR scanning. Again, with the routine MR, you will do a non-contrast and a contrast study just to evaluate what the, is there a tumor is. And then you do more sophisticated spectroscopy, perfusion, functional and tactography on MR uh, to delineate furthermore if you are in a doubt what the diagnosis is and, and help the surgeon to navigate her or her himself into the tumor without damaging uh, the normal brain tissue and to preserve as much as functional um, uh, function of a brain patient post-surgically. And then of course you have PET MR, which is not available in Sri Lanka at the moment. And uh, that is to see where the viable tumor is and especially post-treatment follow-up to see whether there's any uh, recurrence. And then of course you have a digital subtraction angiogram, which is DSA, just to see whether there's any, when you have a very high vascular tumor, you're not sure whether it's a vascular tumor or a tumor, then you might do a just a diagnostic uh, angiogram. And if it is a very high vascular one and if you're planning for a resection, you might even, the surgeon might ask us to do some pre-surgical embolization to reduce the vascularity. So the, 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 during surgery, the blood loss will be less and the surgical fluid will be a much clearer feel. So the resection could be much uh, easier for the surgeon. A uh, bit about the X-rays, uh, usually we hardly use it. More commonly we use for in peripheries, which you don't have any uh, especially in pituitary tumor, you might see this, the widening of the pituitary cell indicating there's something going on in the pituitary region. And if it is clinically uh, suggestive, then you have to go for a cross-sectional imaging. And in old days, we used to see these calcified brain tumors, just a pure plain skull X-ray might even delineate the X-ray uh, showing a calcified tumor inside the brain. 
this is very uh, limited value in, uh, in our days, but still uh, in a part of this part of the country, we might use it in the periphery when you can't get access to a cross-sectional image. A uh, bit of history, which are usually done in the past, but nowadays we don't hardly use this. This is pneumocephalography. You might see that you insert air into the ventricular system and you see whether it's dilated. If it is deviated to some, some side, then you might think there's brain tumor. This is a conventional angiogram, and you can see there's playing of the blood vessels indicating A very old image that this is what you call the ventriculography. Uh, you puncture the left third uh, lateral ventricles, inject some dye, and get some imaging of what's happening with the ventricular system. Uh, these uh, X-ray techniques are really obsolete now, uh, but this is how the old neurosurgeons used to diagnose brain tumors before going in. And looking at uh, ultrasound scanning, uh, it's mostly used in uh, children you can see this in these images this uh, when the fontanel is not fused you can see easily the hydrocephalus and you might see even a small and if it is a very peripheral and very accessible on a patient you might even delineate the vascularity of the lesion as well some people used to use it for the intraoperative navigation as well and moving into the more cross-sectional imaging basic CT scanning might very easily delineate what is happening in the brain and then you might end up doing a contrast study to further depending on the contrast enhancement pattern you might be able to uh, narrow your differential diagnosis and location might give a possible histological diagnosis as well. Nowadays, we usually always go into the basic MR imaging following a CT. What are the basic imaging structures we have at MR? You have T1, that's to delineate more like anatomy of the brain and where the location, whether it's a cortical based tumor or a parenchymal based tumor. And then you have T2 imaging where you can see where the abnormality is easily and so see the perlesional edema and whether there are a small lesion which you might not be seen on T1 and the flare you will be easily see where the perilational edema and to see what part of the brain is the tumor and what is perilational edema. And of course you have a diffusion weighted imaging then you might be able to see the, the so if you see this lesion is uh, partly cystic and partly solid and then you can see there's a uh, diffusion restriction in this lesion which is the active lesion because this part has been already necrosed and by diffusion weighting what you mean either it's a highly vascular uh, highly cellular tumor or it's a very aggressive tumor so diffusion restriction narrows down whether it's going to be a high grade uh, lesion or a, 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 a low grade one and then of course you do contrast and it will be further help you to narrow down your diagnosis Yes, we have at hand uh, spectroscopy. Uh, this is the normal spectroscopy you see in mini and choline and creatinine peaks. This is the normal appearance of a spectroscopy. And uh, if you go to a low grade gliomas, you will still have a, a, a high peaking of choline, but you will have a lowering of it. But it will be more further reduced when you come to high grade. So there is a, a way of thinking whether it's a high grade or a low grade astrocytoma and then it comes to lymphoma we always have a very high choline peaks with lower in the values this is a true imaging of uh, spectroscopy and you might again see the same differences what you expected in a tumor either you can do a single voxel spectroscopy multi-voxel depending on the size of the tumor and you can have variety of areas of uh, seeing within the tumor. So you might have a part of the lesion having a low grade tumor, but at one point you might even have a high grade. And there, where I, that should be the place that you will be telling the surgeon to do the biopsy. So what else you can do uh, with MR, it's, uh, the functional MR. I think Dr. 
Street Trunk has told us. And uh, especially when you have a tumor, you have to see where the dominant uh, brain, and these are the, the this is active foresight that you can see the receptive and the, uh, motor cortex of the uh, locus and vernicase areas. You do the uh, paradigms and see where the the activity is, and then you can always say that the tumor is very close, but it's not there. So you can counsel the patient that it might have a little bit of a change in your uh, uh, speech following uh, the surgery. But when you see that it's, it's really into the dominant hemisphere, but you can always guide the surgeon and say that it's very close, but it's not in many. So we might be able to preserve the functionality of that patient. Then you have a diffusion tensor imaging and tractography where you do all the white matter tracks. And this is vision where you can see that all the white matter tracks are closing in. So there's one track which is going into the temporal lobe is being obstructed by the lesion, which is already been damaged, but you can always see, see what are the other close by tracks and guide the surgeon to pres preserve uh, minimize the damage that is happen, going to happen during the surgery. All these imaging facilities are available at Lanka and you should be proud as Lanka Hospital having all these uh, imaging modality at one center. Of course, PETEMA is the other, which is not available in Sri Lanka at the moment. This is, of course, you can see there's a lesion there and this is the, the high uptake, you can see uptake here. And this is the more active lesion you could be targeting when you're doing the biopsy to take a part of this to make the presentation of the true treatment of the patient. Then when it comes to a sub, a DSA, you always do a diagnostic MR and then you know where the lesion is and if you're suspect there's too much of vascularity, sometimes you might do just a diagnosis to see what are the supplying vessel and so that Urgent to go and tackle the lesion. And if it's a lesion like this, which is a, a, a well known lesion, we call it angiomas, neural based, which has a usually have an external cavity supply, field appearance, and it's sometimes they ask to embolize. And this is how it looks like when you embolize. You do a, a, a very careful embolization of the tumor so that it will shrink in size and make the life easy for the surgeon. So overall, uh, incidence of brain tumors, uh, so it depends on the studies, but it always varies among uh, studies. So 5 to 13 per 100,000 for adults, and it will be less than in children. And 80% of the cranial tumors will be uh, supertrentorial, and 70% of tumors in uh, less than one year old. Clinical features, I won't go into details as Dr. Sreekanth has discussed on in detail about this. So uh, what are the three simple steps in uh, uh, radiographic interpretation? First is detection, localization, and characterization. So detecting, it will be, sometimes it's very big, very easy. You will see a large lesion like this, or it will be very subtle like this. So careful evaluation, depending on the clinical symptoms and all the imaging available on in detail would be uh, the first priority in order to diagnose whether there's an actual brain tumor in. Uh, when it comes to localization, it's very important to uh, delineate whether it's an intraaxial or extraaxial. In, uh, for who's a non-medical colleague, I would say intraaxial is within the parenchyma, that is within the brain, or it's whether it's extraaxial means it's just outside the covering of the brain matter between the skull and the brain matter. So this is a extraaxial lesion. You can see it's within the uh, brain parenchyma and this is just outside the covering of the brain matter, but inside the uh, skull, this is what you call extraaxial lesion. And whenever you have a lesion within the, the, the cavities which carries fluid inside, which are called ventricles, these are also called as extra axial lesions. So there are a few uh, steps to diagnose this. Uh, this is uh, more radiology, but I would just 
there. What's the easy way of diagnosing? You can see the, the deviation of the brain covering. You will have interposing blood vessels between the lips and the brain. And then you have some gray matter covering the gray matter between the lesion and the brain, which are the, the definitive signs of uh, axial lesions. And then you might not even see, even with a very large lesion, if you don't see much of uh, perilational edema and this gray matter covering, then you will think it's as an extraaxial rather than an intraaxial. Of course, a very low grade glioma can mimic these uh, uh, similar appearances. So, what are the things that you are looking at a when you see a tumor in the uh, radiology menu? You will have to see the borders, whether it's a well defined or ill defined. Well defined means it's uh, less aggressive, and ill defined is likely to be a more aggressive lesion. And then it's very important whether it's where it is located, whether it's infiltrative or just uh, sitting there in the uh, middle of the brain. And then you go into tumor characterization, you see whether there's calcification, hemorrhages, cystic changes. And then, of course, DWI will say whether the, whether the tumor is very uh, cellular or not. And then depending on the enhancement pattern, again, you might see whether it's an aggressive lesion or not. And then, of course, you ultimately will see the, what's happening around the surrounding structures, because that will ultimately depend on the treatment modality and whether it's accessible for surgical without much uh, functional disability for the patient. And then, of course, you have to see uh, what's uh, what is giving the uh, symptoms for the patient because of the compression or edema of the particular tumor. So the uh, few broad categories, uh, you have neuroepithelial, roughly around 50% of tumors, out of it, astrocytic forms for 44%. This is basically a radiological uh, uh, category. And then you have medulloblastoma, pandemoma, all neuroepithelial cells. You have meningiomas and metastasis coming for about 50% of all of it. Then you have primary CNS lymphoma and pineal. These are just the, uh, the principal uh, brain tumors that I'm going to show you some imaging. So neuroepithelial tumors uh, in astrocytoma, there are four grades, one and two are usually benign, three and four, and as the, uh, the grade goes up, the uh, malignancy goes, uh, also increases, usually found in adults, mainly in frontal and temporal bones, but there are have anywhere in the block. These are usual cases, but rare in children, and if that happens, it will be points. This is the imaging of a low-grade glioma. You can see there's a very nice lesion, well-defined. You can easily see this lesion. And T2, you can see it's very nicely delineated. But there is no significant edema. And in, when you come to contrast, there is no significant spectroscopy, then you can see choline is going up. In a still high, not as low as you would expect in a high-grade glioma. So this is called what you call a low-grade glioma. So uh, glioblastoma multiforme is the most malignant uh, tumor of CNS, which is very rapidly progressive. Usually occurs in men in the 50s or 60s. A uh, deep part of the cerebral hemisphere affected and it can metastasize through the uh, CSF, usually has cystic changes, necrosis, hemorrhages, and diffusion restriction. This is a tumor, which is a multi, uh, glioblastoma multiform. You can see the very ill-defined, irregular lesion in left frontal region, which edema, causing compression of the ipsilateral lateral ventricle, mild mediastinal shift, if you do, the, this is what you call the SWI, susceptibility weighted imaging. You can see some part of them have hemorrhages. And if you do a diffusion, a clear diffusion restriction indicating whether it's it's very highly cellular lesion. And when you do the contrast study, you will always see these patchy areas with rim enhancement indicating central part of the lesion is necros, the aggressive nature of the lesion of the vascularity, that's why it has gone into necrosis. And if you do a 
spectroscopy, you will see a very high calling with reduction of NAA. And in fact, uh, confidently diagnose this as a uh, glioblastoma multiforme. Uh, further into neuroepithelial tumors, uh, these ependymal cell tumors, which are within the ventricular system, accounts for about 3% of all CNA tumors. It can happen in children as well as in adults. Usually in the fourth ventricle, you will get some sort of an obstructive hydrocarbon, and it usually spreads through the CSF and metastasizes into the CA as well. This is a very nice delineation of the lesion. These ependymas, though they are sitting in the fourth ventricle, they are very fragile. They can just go through, through all the spaces, and especially you can see here, it's going through the ramens extending out of the fourth fragile and very soft tumor, but you will have very high cellularity. That's why you will see some sort of uh, diffusion restriction, not as high as the, the diffuse uh, anaplastic uh, astrocytomas, but still you will have some sort of uh, diffusion restriction. You will have some sort of hemorrhagic and calcification, but you what you have is an obstructive hydrocephalus, not because of its closing down the fourth ventricle, but it produces a proteinaceous material, which goes and covers the arachnoid granulations, giving rise to communicating obstructive hydrocephalus. And the next common uh, neuroepithelial tumor would be neuroectodermal tumors, which are called ectodermal tumors. You usually see it in children, and they are very highly malignant. The most common one would be the medulloblastomas, 23% of CNA in children, which occurs in the vermis cerebral hemispheres, which has a very rapid progression of the CSF phase. And it all depends on whether it can be resected properly and if whether it's uh, have diagnosis at the time of uh, diagnosis, whether it has metastasized. And the second most common uh, peanut would be a pineal blastoma, which is the most common supertrentorial one, and it accounts for about 15% of peanuts. This is a medulloblastoma. You can see it's the roof of the fourth ventricle again, and it's very highly vascular. You can see the concentrated, and you can see in this patient, it has been already metastasized through the meninges, giving this material enhancement along the spinal cord as well. A bit about uh, tumors in childhood. 20% uh, of all tumors of childhood accounts for the brain tumors. They are frequently malignant than in adults and more frequently localized in the uh, infratentory, that is in the lower part of the brain. And uh, the least common neuroepithelial tumor would be oligodendrogliomas, usually in adults. Uh, frequently, they can have a bit of a calcification. Frontal and temporal lobes are the most location of uh, these lesions. They are usually benign and have a very advanced uh, well, and recently, with the new WHO classification, uh, uh, old days, if you have a calcification and a tumor, you used to call it oligodendroglyomas. But now we have these uh, mutations and immunochemistry studies to delineate which type of uh, oligodendroglyoma with the new uh, WHO classification. So, imaging per se doesn't, uh, uh, or the histology per se doesn't really can't call it oligodendroglioma unless you do this uh, uh, mutation study. So how does it look like? It's usually a cortical-based tumor. It's not very well defined. You can see it's a cortical lesion. It's not that clear as a astrocytoma. You again see it's in more on T2. You can have a bit of an enhancement, uh, more or less. And your CT, you might see even calcification and then have a spectroscopy low-grade glioma appearance. Uh, what else you have in neuroepithelial is the, the choroid plexus tumors, which are more common in uh, children with papilloma or carcinomas, and usually they present a bit uh, obstructive, uh, non-obstructive hydrocephalus because of the reproduction of CSF by these tumors, which is very well seen on imaging, even ultrasound, you might up usually in the lateral ventricles in the childhood or in the ventricle as in adults. 
it will be very highly vascular tumor with very much enhancement and you will and com communicate non obstructive hydrocephalus csf overproduction and you can see csf seepage of because of this hydrocephalus as well and if you think these are the papillomas which is benign and if you see very well uh, irregular or inhomogeneous enhancement and infiltration of the brain matter then you have to think of uh, 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 choroid plexus carcinoma as well so moving on to secondary brain tumors which are the most common uh, infratentorial adult lesions uh, accounts for about 15 to 20 percent of all brain tumors usually uh, sometimes it will be the Malignancy, they are not aware, or it will be a secondary to a known malignant patient, and malignant uh, these metastases could be into brain tissues or into meninges, and, uh, even into CSF. So, what are the most common uh, primaries? The lung, breast, and kidney, with together with malignant melanoma, being the uh, forerunners for these, and of course, by GFL. So, it, it's quite easy to pick it up on the cross-sectional imaging. The lesion will be a small lesion. If you have multiple, of course, it's very easy to diagnose whether it's a um, uh, brain lesion. But if you have a solitary lesion, of course, the lesion will be uh, smaller in size with a disproportionate amount of paralysis. Then you think of a metastasis than a primary tumor. You have an enhancing, very well-defined lesion with a disproportionate size of uh, perilational edema, which will uh, think of a secondary if it is a, a adult patient who has doesn't have any history, even without any history of uh, primary malignancy. So uh, metastasis can happen to skull bone. You can see there's a lesion is in the skull invading into the brain. And but if you can see that it's mainly a skull metastasis, that's why you don't see much of perilational edema. But then you have This is a very nice uh, picture showing where the initial metastasis. You can see the enhancement of uh, cranial nerves. You can see the meningeal enhancement along the salsi and gyri. And this is a patient with a metastatic bre uh, breast with having a, a meningeal metastasis. So tumors of the meninges, it also accounts for about 15% of brain tumors. It can locate anywhere along the, the uh, coverings and uh, the, the clinical presentation depending on the location. So if it is a paraconvexity one, it will present with its seizures. Then if you have olfactory uh, group one, then you can have anosmia, CP angle, you will have hearing loss, or um, uh, even if sometimes it can be incidental finding without any symptoms if it is a very small one. Usually they are benign, but there are aggressive forms of meningiomas which can invade into the brain matter. And usually you have a adjacent bone hypertrostosis because of the uh, meningeal supply, you will get that supply into the bone as well, which will hypertrose secondary to the high vascularity in the region. And the usual uh, imaging finding that we are looking for is the dural tail, which is enhancing along the dura, which is attached to the lesion. Um, giving rise to neural. These are some of the lo locations that you can see. This is a sagittal meningioma. This is what you call the dural tail. Apart from the lesion, you might see a bit of enhancement along the dura, which is with the attachment. We call the dural tail. This is clearly, you can see, this is what you call hyperostosis, which is on the margin because of the hypervascularity. You call it hyperostosis. This is a very nice picture of uh, olfactory uh, meningioma. You can see that uh, spoke wheel like appearance. These patients will present with anosmia. And this is uh, intraventricular meningioma. You can see it, it looks a bit aggressive, but if you do a uh, contrast study, they, you will see a very nice lesion with a bit of uh, obstructive to the left lateral ventricle, causing a bit of seepage. This is a meningioma in the CP angle. You can see it close to the the eighth and seventh nerve, so we will have any pulses of this side on the right side. You can see it's extra axial lesion with a very nice homogeneous enhancement. And people might even present with this much of uh, multiple meningiomas, especially 
patients with uh, neurofibromatosis type 2, you might have uh, uh, multiple meningiomatosis. So what else uh, you can do with meningiomas? You can do the, the vascular imaging, the angiograms. And then when you do angiograms, principally the meningiomas will be having uh, external carotid supply, but when it grows as the grows, if it is getting bigger, then you will end up having file supply as well. Uh, file supply as well. And uh, looking at these uh, images, what you call a typical angiographic appearance that is called the uh, mother-in-law phenomenon, which means it comes early and stays later. So it's uh, called mother-in-law phenomenon. And if you want to do a surgery, then you do a bit of embolization to make the life surgeons easy. Uh, and you have the tumors of the cellar region, about 8% of brain tumors. You can have a lot of uh, variety of uh, differential diagnosis in tumors of the cellar region. You can have, you know, craniopharyngiomas, meningiomas, cysts, and, and then of course they will mostly presented with uh, bitemporal hemianosphere because of the chiasmic compression, and then you have endocrine pathology as well. Skull X-rays, you might see the cellar chuchica, and these are the all there are have a whole lot of variety of lesions. This is a patient with uh, craniopharyngioma with fluid levels and a cystic component, a macroadenoma doing a, a showman's appearance, can have a meningioma, cyst, rapkinesis, and very large aneurysm also uh, can have a supracellar uh, extension as well. Uh, sorry, uh, when it comes to the vestibular schoenoma, another common findings about 8% of brain tumors, usually happens in uh, about 8% of, it's, uh, it counts for 80% of uh, CP angle tumors, Bilateral schoenomas can happen in, in a two clinical presentation would be uh, tinnitus or sensory neural hearing loss. And these are the common features that you will see. A very nice lesion going has intracanular as well as intracanular extension. You will have a nice enhancement. You can have cystic component and necrotic lesions. And you might even have a lesion just intracanular very tiny lesion. You have to do a high resolution uh, CP angle evaluation and post contrast study to pick up these tiny intracranular uh, schoenomas as well. Uh, a bit above, because of the time, I'll run through some of the primary CNS lymphomas, which are less common tumors. Uh, it has to be diagnosed when you don't have a core 16 systemic disease. Usually they are hyper intense on uh, uh, CT able to identify these lesions very easily uh, depending on because it has a very high vascularity the cellularity you will have a diffusion later imaging and it will be very hyperdense if you are lucky it will be hyperdense on CT images and you have the typical lymphoma uh, appearance on uh, spectroscopy as well. Uh, finally, the pineal tumors uh, relatively poor differential diagnosis there are a lot of uh, yeah, it can have symptoms because of the compression of the third ventricle outflow, depending on the location. There's a whole lot of uh, differential if you look at pineal tumors, but just to show a few of the images, it can be incidental finding like a cyst. You can have germ cell tumors, most common area of germ cell tumors in the pineal region. Then you have pineal uh, cytoma, and then you can even have diffusion restriction, and even a meningioma at this stage. Uh, I won't go into details of intracranial germ cell tumors. Again, it will be uh, very uh, rare lesions, but germinomas are the most common uh, uh, cases out of all, about 60%. And uh, the imaging wise, you will see a lesion principally in the gland region, or it can We have a you sometimes you might be able to pick it up these lesions on MR image. Uh, with that, I will conclude because of the time and. Uh,
Um, so thank you, Dr. Gane um, It was very nice to see all those, well, not so nice tumors. Um, without uh, much delay, if there are any questions, if you could uh, send them in the chat and we can try and arrest, um, address them later. But I'd like to move on to a short break. But during that break, uh, we'll be having a couple of testimonials from patients who underwent surgery. And, surgery. and um, we'll just take a short break for about 10, 15, 10 minutes, five minutes, five to 10 minutes. Thank you. Mama, Harshani Priyanka, Agalavatta, Matukama. Mama, Mage, Gia, Dedas, we say, Juni, we see Deka, Operation Nekakara, Ulua, Yedia, Sambandava. We may, may Operation Neka, Operation Nekata, Doctor Slatamai, Mati Hatune. Sata Pepper, name in a cotton, then a root the kina, Yama Sivsi decata, operation again, the maybe a comma, Mata Kissima, Amarukama, Kissima de Anne, then Kohetna, operation Nika Karaki, but Mata made then in a hand. Tim Mama operation again, the Rana Kalim, Mata Gudakma, me Roger Lakshana Gudak, the Tipuna. Feet take a haduna, feet taking at Saria Kitravake, Masa Pahakatula Kodama Haduna, eating a pen and the doctor can some bandha hoela, another may private hospital, a rail and castle like it. I think a big Tagodama hoela may balanopote on the doctor Sladinik, a pita hambona putata, thing a pita may medihatela. Ruku Kedia, Kakiani Ruku operation Neka, by the high Kakunaka Ruku operation Neka, Sata Kataraga, Adaman Kisima Amarua, Asanipia Natua, Adaman Sitini, Ada Katagarani, the Mangodak Makian None, may Doctor Slatta Godak me Doctor Sladina Pradana, a Tamatarava, our Doctor Slatta Game, Godama. Staff, aka Godak Katia, Mata Godak Mudakara. I think Mama Godakma, when we are a home, Magia Agame Hatiatama Godakma, Egonantama Godak, Miss Tutu Antavena, Pink Atama, Godakma, Adamang me inne, a doctor Slahinda Tamaya, the Manga, the Chivatela inne. I think Mama Kian known a Hamoto, Mammy Kiane, Leda Kasani Piakunat Balag and Nibata Mante, unknown a Hundama Daksha than Doctor Slalangra di Hilla, Tamame operation, Tianamana, the Akasari Payagidi Aroma, Tianamana, Hundama Tanata, Doctor Slalangra di Hilla, May de Penella, Keranavana, among other Jiva Tenava Gamer, Hogalanta, Simakarada and Natua. I am Sriya. We were living in Australia since 2012. In 2017, we came to Sri Lanka for a holiday. Went to an optician to check and change reading glasses because I was having problems in reading. For our surprise, it was reported that my right eye was completely blind and left eye partially blind. We consulted so many eye surgeons. Dr. Champa Banagala finally detected the cause of my blindness. It was meningioma in the size of a golf ball. Blocking optic nerve, we performed the 13-hour long surgery and removed the tumor completely to the perfection. I took good care of myself. Since then, periodically checked, checked MRI reports and finally has declared that I am fit to travel back to Australia. There was a photograph of my optic nerve at the time of surgery that, that was photographed by I got the vision back 
on my both eyes. Dr. Champa Banagala presented my case at the convention, suggesting that blindness could occur due to a tumor blocking the optic nerve. Furthermore, she shared my case with her colleagues, with the colleagues of neurosurgeons, suggesting that a behavioral change might cause due to a frontal tumor. We as a family always thankful. I think my case is extraordinary, where somebody loses eyesight and regains it full. I am happy to share this message today for the benefit of those who suffer. Now let me introduce uh, Dr. Ruini Abekunratna, consultant neurosurgeon, Lanka Hospital, and Royal uh, Salford NHS Trust in the United Kingdom. Over to you, Dr. Ruini Abekunratna. Hi. So, uh, thank you, um, Jeevana. So, I would, I, I, I'm quite very aware that we have a mixed audience today, um, varying between uh, medical and non-medical um, participants. So, I'm going to try and keep it very simple. It's much easier for me as well because, as a surgeon, I think very simply. And if it actually, if it's too simple or too complex, let me know uh, at the end and we'll try and explain things to you. So um, I'm going to talk about the surgical management of brain tumors and go through uh, a few clinical cases, which makes it a little bit more interesting. So we can put a, 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 a sort of um, a person behind the treatment and the, and the management. So, so these are the main objectives. I'm going to go through a little bit of basic anatomy. Um, classification of brain tumors, I'm not going to cover in detail as uh, Dr. Ganyavatta and Dr. Srikant have covered them. Uh, discuss the management through clinical cases and what the aim of surgery is and how we decide on what type of surgery or whether we do operate or not. Uh, a few, and at the end, a little bit about the molecular advances in uh, neurosurgery and how we use it, and also new treatments in the pipeline. So a little bit of basic anatomy, and I'm really sorry if this is uh, very, very uh, basic for some, but our brain is sort of protected by the skull, which acts as a barrier between the outside and the inside. So these are the eye sockets here, if you can see them. And we have the skull vault, which covers the brain. And if you can see here, when we open up the skull, we have a layer, which is called the meninges surrounding the brain itself, which is a protective layer. And you have the, uh, the brain tissue, which is just underneath. And it has a, a lot of sort of sulci and gyri, as we call it and different areas of the brain uh, perform different functions. So um, when starting off, most medical students will get an idea of uh, what uh, different areas of the brain do. Unfortunately for us, it doesn't come in a color coordinated fashion intraoperatively, but we generally have an idea that the frontal, uh, frontal pole or the frontal lobe deals with behavior changes, et cetera, that the most important bits are around the central sulcus, uh, here where it can uh, affect your motor function or how we walk, talk, etc. Then we have the temporal lobe, which is at the bottom here, which uh, again has specific functions, but seizure, this is a very high, um, uh, there's a very high incidence of seizure function here. And then this is what we call the cerebellum, and also we call it the uh, uh, super uh, the intratentorial compartment of the brain or the small brain. And this is the supratentorial compartment or uh, the brain that is above this area. So it's very important for us when we're categorizing tumors and operative approaches that we have. So what is a tumor? This is extremely basic. It's an abnormal um, uh, mass of tissue. And what has happened is it's lost the control uh, that is ha that it has, and 
it grows uncontrollably. And the mechanisms which were inbuilt into our body or to our system have lost control. So it goes off the track of normal growth and this causes um, a growth or a lesion or a tumor to be born. So what is a primary brain tumor? So primary brain tumors are generally ones or born in the brain itself. So that means they arise from the layers of the brain or like the meninges, as I explained before. Um, it arises from the tissue of the brain, which is a parenchyma. And these parenchymal tissues can be divided into different uh, types of cells, which are the glial tissues, which are astrocytomas, epiderm uh, epidermal cells, etc. So these are classified according to exactly where uh, they start from. The World Health Organization um, classifies actual tumors and they classify tumors uh, as arising from the brain and which tissues and also of the spinal cord, because as neurosurgeons, we deal with the brain and tumors arising in the rest of the central nervous system. A secondary brain tumor is a tumor which uh, has spread, uh, spread from elsewhere through the blood, uh, blood or hematologically and can arise from cancers or tumors elsewhere in the body. The commonest ones to spread are breast, lung, prostate, skin, and also from uh, your colon and renal. So these, these generally have a different way in which we manage them because we have to take that into consideration as well. So just this is a very busy slide and it's just for your information. You can see how many brain tumors there are and some covered today by uh, the uh, previous speakers, but there are multiple and it's all, all sort of classified by, uh, and, it, and this classification keeps changing as we, uh, as we go along. So how do we diagnose a tumor? So initially, um, we, we generally do not get patients coming to us um, as a first line because uh, I, I don't really see patients with headaches as such, and they are referred by other specialists. So it can be from a neurologist or an oncologist, or a general physician who's examined them in clinic. And generally when they do arrive at our, our clinics, they have uh, the relevant in, uh, imaging which has been done. We do occasionally get patients who come to the emergency department after a seizure and where they've been diagnosed with um, a tumor. It's extremely important even as a neurosurgeon that we take a thorough history from the patient and examine the patient. I generally have a discuss, look at the scans myself, but it is extremely important to go through the scans with a, um, a specialized uh, neuroradiologist because it gives us an idea of what it could be and how to approach it if we were going to operate. 90% of the time, just by the history and how the patient presents and with the radiology diagnosis, we can come to a general idea of what kind of tumor this is gonna end up to be. And then, the decisions were made whether we operate or not operate or manage conservatively. So the actual decision decision making process is mainly whether to operate or not, when to operate and how to operate. In the UK and here as well, to a great extent, um, we have a, um, a multidisciplinary meeting to discuss what options are available. So as a, again, I'd like to stress that you have to consider what the management is for the patient, taking into account their uh, prognosis and their quality of life, and of course, discussing with the family as to whether this is the best thing. It has to be an informed consent, and the discussion can take up to about an hour where you have to answer questions and what the medical management would be and what the surgical options are. Um, as I said, the most difficult part is not operating on certain occasions when we decide that they're not fit. So again, factors which uh, come into play that we consider condition of the patient, age has an impact, but not in general anymore because most patients can have an anesthetic and generally you know, come through it without any problems. Whether it's primary or secondary, the location, how accessible the tumor is, is extremely important. The size of the tumor, in general, the smaller it is um, and the closer it is to the surface of the brain, the easier it is to take out. 
The grade of the tumor is when we classify tumors, we histologically or even radiologically, we can get an idea of if it's a very aggressive tumor or whether it's more of a, a benign tumor. What the patient presents with, for example, the neurological deficits or what weaknesses the patient has or um, how their speech is affected, um, how impacted they are, and also what we may cause as surgeons, any neurological deficits and the risks of it um, is discussed in detail. The multidisciplinary, the multidisciplinary approach is again very important. Okay, so the decision of surgery when it's made, when we've decided, okay, surgery is the best option available for this patient, we, I generally have a discussion with the patient and family. We have to, at that stage, discuss the risks um, that may occur intraoperative and postoperatively, and also uh, what the procedure involves and how the day will uh, pan out. Because uh, these things, although simple, are very important to the patient. We have to receive informed consent. I know patients sign a consent form and sometimes they sign it without even understanding what they're going through. But legally, medical legally, it is very important that a senior consultant or the consultant who is operating actually takes the consent from the patient. We then refer to, well, I then refer to my anesthetist, who is the next most important person in um, uh, managing the patient. And after discussion, we arrange a date. Generally, I also discuss the uh, radiology with uh, our consultant radiologists for approach and how or what we might expect during surgery, whether something is extremely vascular or has a tendency to bleed, or whether uh, there are interventional things that we can do prior to going into surgery. I know Dr. Ganevas explained that you can embolize certain tumors that will block the blood supply so it becomes easier for us to um, resect the whole thing. If these are complicated cases, I generally discuss it with my colleagues as well, because more minds better. And at the end of the day, our aim should be giving, taking the patient's best interest into heart. Then, of course, as a neurosurgeon, I plan the technical aspects of surgery. Uh, we now have a GPS system, so we don't really need uh, anatomy, although if there are medical students re uh, listening in, we have to know the basics, And but this guides us during surgery as well. We also do nerve monitoring, and then I decide whether the patient's operation can be done awake or uh, whilst they're asleep. The aim of surgery is to completely resect the tumor. So I would, in earlier days when I started my training, we used to do biopsies a lot because mainly the prognosis of tumors were so bad that we didn't want to put the patient through any a major surgery, so a biopsy was done. But these days, um, most of the time, um, a complete resection is what we need. And we, to achieve a complete resection without causing a neurological deficits or any problems to the patient. If complete resection is not possible, in some cases, they may, the tumors may be wrapped around nerves or be in important parts of the brain that we cannot take out, uh, then the, the theory is, or the plan is, or uh, we should take more than 95% of the tumor and whatever is left, uh, left over can be uh, treated with other modes such as radiation, et cetera. And at the end of the day, the main thing is that we have to maintain a good quality of life for a patient. Surgically, it's very easy to take bits of the brain, uh, but when the patient wakes up or if the patient wakes up, unable to move one side of the body, even though you've resected the uh, tumor completely, quality of life is appalling. So um, that's not the aim. So what is a craniotomy? So simply, again, I apologize if this is too basic, but it, what we do is raise a skin fat. The Red Indians used to do this really well by scalping people, but uh, we do it in a more methodical way. We isolate and uh, mark the place in which uh, we need to get in and we take the skin away, um, and flap it. Uh, that's why we call it a skin flap. And then we use a drill um, to make a few holes and then we lift up the part of the skull we need to lift up to get access. 
So this you can see is um, the skin flap in an actual patient and the bone has been removed off um, and taken on the sides, taken out from the sides and you can just about see the brain uh, underneath. Uh, this might be a bit gory for patient uh, participants, but this, these are what we use. And uh, I have used uh, what we call the jiggly store, which we make two holes underneath, pass a, a literally a, a, a thin wired saw underneath the uh, bone and just saw away. Um, then we have what we call a Hudson brace, which is again a drill where you attach, uh, there's an attachment here and uh, you make the holes with it to access the brain. But now thankfully things have changed and we have really, really good um, drills available. We have pneumatic drills and also um, electric uh, drills, which are very precise and do not cause uh, much um, interference. So what happens during a craniotomy? So obviously again, informed consent and the patient is um, put on the general anesthesia by uh, the consultant anesthetist. Um, generally, if it's a long procedure, but in most cases, if the case is uh, going on for more than an hour, we catheterize the patient. We protect when somebody is anesthetized, we have to be extremely careful of pressure points along their bodies. For instance, if you have your elbow on the side of a, of a table for a duration of five hours, you can get uh, quite significant uh, problems with that. So we protect those pressure points with jelly pads, etc. We stabilize the head in clamps, which you can see here. I don't know if it's clear, but that's so that the patient, there's no movement and the, the site is protected um, throughout. Then we register the navigation system. This is what we call uh, the GPS, actually. We register the patient using their facial uh, features and uh, static areas so that this gives us an idea of where we have to go and to mark the inc incision. And also once we open the skull, it guides us as to where the tumor is. Obviously, you have to have some knowledge of anatomy to get to where you are and what are the structures around it. But in general, this helps us a lot and has actually made incisions much smaller than they, they used to be. I mean, large incisions are rarely needed these days. Um, we then wash the hair, shave, and mark the incision. We, we then enter into a sterile field where the patient is prepped and draped. And we always go through a WHO checklist to make sure uh, the patient is safe, all the details are checked and that um, everybody's ready and agrees with what we're going to do, then the operation takes place. So you can see in this picture, there's quite a number of people uh, in theater um, and there's a lot of machinery as well. Um, there's the anesthetist normally sits on this side and this is her equipment where she monitors the heart, uh, uh, blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have a, a, a machine for the imaging at the back. We, this is the uh, my, part of the microscope. And you can see this is Dr. Prasanna Gunasena who's registering the patient uh, for the navigation system. And you can actually see at the back um, where things, it guides us as to where we're going. And then we have a couple of, uh, we have a scrub nurse and we may have two then uh, this is me, and this is Dr. Jeevana who assists me here. And then the anesthetist has uh, a couple of people as well. We generally have to use the intraoperative MRI scan, uh, uh, not MRI, so the microscope, uh, which is depicted here. We bring it uh, down and uh, use that. So this is, this is me in my happy place as per usual. Uh, the operation is coming to an end. And uh, this is what you generally see uh, post-operatively, this is just one of the scars for a temporal lesion, and uh, they have head shaven, and this is after the wound's been healed. We generally have a, a drain coming out as well, which we take out in 24, 48 hours. So a, a new tech, it's not a new technique. I trained with this, but what we, what is recommended these days is if at all possible, and if the tumors are in a, a sensitive area, especially affecting language, um, motor function, if it's dominant hemisphere in most people, which is the left uh, area, we, I try and do an awake craniotomy. 
I'm unfortunately in Sri Lanka trying to convince a patient to be uh, awake during surgery is far more difficult than doing the operation itself. So patient selection is very important um, as well because uh, being in a place where your head is fixed, um, although it's not painful, um, is it's quite uh, disturbing for some. So again, we consent a patient to this anesthetized with sedation, and then we give local anesthesia to the incision site. Patients catheterized to make them very comfortable. The head is stabilized again in pins and navigations registered. The patient is in more of a sitting up position because then they have when they wake up, they can see people and they can talk to the anesthetist and we can check their language function as we go along. We, I generally cortically map with the, the nerve monitoring that we have and test the areas beforehand and obviously um, discuss the scans um, with the, the radiologist beforehand as well. Uh, the patient is woken up intraoperatively and they normally take about 20 minutes to wake up and then we gradually um, uh, start asking them questions and we may even um, get them to do some uh, uh, simple tasks as well. Um, it, it, patient selection again is the most important bit. So this is a picture of one of the awake, crani uh, awake craniotomies we did. This is the patient's left side um, and you can see I've uh, taken some of the hair off and an incision's marked. The patient is looking towards um, actually, that's the right side. The patient's looking towards the left, and we have a little bar. Um, sorry, my mouse isn't. Let's see if I can use this. So we have a bar across here, so that we can lift up this area, or the anesthetist can speak to the patient. So, which is like this. Okay, so this is a patient here. The patient's awake because you can see they're just having a, a, a face mask uh, for oxygen there. And then I'm at the back here with the staff and there's somebody always with the patient, constantly talking to them to reassure them. So this is not one of my pictures. This is one of Prem Pillay's uh, and you can see that they're wide awake. And this is uh, um, uh, Mr. Pillay at the back operating on the patient. Um, they have clear drapes. Unfortunately, we don't have clear drapes here, but uh, as you can see, the patient looks very comfortable. I'm sorry for this. I had mixed reactions putting this in, uh, which is a, uh, just a, a, a picture where it shows that I've, uh, where I've resected the whole tumor. So this, uh, the gap in the middle is the tumor. Oh, my, this mouse isn't So this is uh, the, the tumor which has been excised. And then this is normal brain surrounding it. This is the dura which has been raised um, and opened up so we can get access to it. This is a bone and the skin flaps around it. So with an awake craniotomy, you can get maximum resection of the tumor because we're checking constantly whether the patient is moving, et cetera. Um, apologize for the, the head bandage on this lady. This was done by Dr. Jeevan and not myself. Um, so this is one of the ladies that we did. Um, and uh, it, it, she did very well. So the, the advantages of doing an awake craniotomy is that uh, we rarely put the patient into intensive care. They go back to the ward because we know what they're like post-operatively. Um, she went home on the second day after surgery. So the time in hospital is reduced. Uh, the pain is reduced. Um, it's a better recovery and the patient seems to if, they, if they're compliant, do much better. And we know because we haven't given them in neurological deficits because we worked up with it. So just to go through some cases. So um, I thought this would be better uh, than going through a lot of scans and things. So uh, first is this patient that we had when I first arrived here a few years ago. I've put a picture of uh, histology as well. This is what the pathologists see um, under um, the microscope. We hardly speak about the pathologists, but at the end of the day, they're the ones that give us the histology, uh, which uh, enable us to manage the patient further. So this is a 56 year old lady who had a one month history of raised ICP. ICP means raised intracranial pressure because when, when the brain is 
contained within a skull, anything that shouldn't be there um, causes pressure symptoms. That means you get uh, headaches, vomiting, um, and uh, present with things that sort of give you, uh, give rise to you thinking about tumors, etc. Anyway, she was admitted after a seizure. And this is an MRI scan that was done at the time, which showed an abnormality. Um, contrast was given, which is an injection that we give to highlight areas, as Dr. Ganyu uh, explained. And we saw this area, um, which looks like um, a tumor. So we approached it um, and we took it all out. So uh, the craniotomy, I removed the skull from here. We used navigation to guide us here. And generally, when you look at tumor under a microscope in the brain and also by feel, you get an idea of which areas are abnormal and which are normal. So you, you can resect most of it. Well, we resected all of it. So we use navigation again, the microscope. We also have, although it's not available here, um, this is an available dye, something called 5 ALA, which is a, a dye that you can give to the patient, which is very clever because it highlights the tumor completely. It gives you a different color of the tumor when you look under a microscope. That also enables us to resect the tumor for greater than 95% of it. Um, we always do a post-operative scan to prove that we've been there and we've taken it out. So unfortunately for this lady, it came back as a glioblastoma. And uh, again, we, we don't have it freely available here, but we did some molecular markers and uh, we then referred her on for uh, counseling chemo um, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. This is another tumor. Um, as you can see, this is uh, the eyes. These are uh, this is a um, section through the brain. This is, you can see quite clear, an abnormal area. This is the temporal lobe of the brain. Um, so this patient presented with very, uh, what we call absent seizures, which she initially, uh, the, he initially got auras of funny smells, and then he would have a, a, a period where he wasn't making any sense to his surrounding people and then was diagnosed with this because they were increasing in frequency. He was treated with that two anti-epileptics by the time and the MRI scan showed this diffuse lesion in the temporal lobe. Um, we thought it could be looking at it, although there was some swelling of the brain tissue itself that it was likely to be a, a low grade tumor. So an awake craniotomy was done and the temporal lobe, depending on whether it's the left side or the right side, that you can safely take quite a chunk of brain out without causing any deficits to the patient. On the left side, it's about five centimeters in back. On the right side, it's six. So we're able to take the bulk of the tumor out, which came back as an astrocytoma grade two. And then we uh, then we refer, there are still studies going on about low grade tumors, et cetera, and trials available, but unfortunately it's not available in this country yet. So we then referred to uh, the oncologist and I'm sure Dr. Sachini will talk about this. In Case three, this is uh, again an abnormality here uh, with uh, an area which was en enhancing. And this was a 34 year old uh, female with headaches and altered behavior again, seizures, and this showed a mixed density lesion, uh, which we did a spectroscopy for, which gave, uh, gave us an idea of uh, what, well, confirmed it was a tumor and also gave us an idea of how aggressive or not it could be. So we did a, a weight craniotomy again with navigation, and I actually um, use a, an ultrasound because when you have a cystic lesion, it's sometimes easier to see um, areas uh, to resect and take out safely. She did very well post-operatively and she was diagnosed as having an oligodendroglioma. The actual um, uh, molecular biology showed that it was 1P19Q um, codilation, which is very good, and she was uh, started on chemotherapy. So this is the lady that uh, you spoke to, uh, the, the lady who gave a testimonial on and had a chat about losing her vision. So this tumor was not small, it was huge. Um, and uh, it, it was probably the size of a large orange and it's an olfactory groove meningioma. Um, and to give you a little background, this patient presented with some personality changes 
um, and uh, visual loss. And we managed to take this whole thing out. It just took a very, very long time. Um, but some parts of it was calcified. It was like born within it because it had been there for years and years and years. Um, just out of interest, um, tumors like this, there was a study done in the UK where uh, in psychiatric uh, homes, uh, they in one particular psychiatric home, they had uh, a new consultant joined and he scanned all the patients who had been uh, there for more than 15 years and 20% had uh, tumors and they were admitted for uh, personality disorder. So this is that lady. So um, she, she did very well. As you can see, um, she did extremely well. She's lovely and I like to see her clinic. It came back as a WHO grade one meningioma, which is uh, benign. And in general, we follow these patients up now. There are some studies that show that you, you have to uh, monitor them. And uh, the guidelines, the nice guidelines are, you may even need to follow them up for life. This is an acoustic, um, which is a vestibular schwannoma. Uh, this patient presented with a loss of hearing and uh, balance problems because this is uh, the cerebellum of a small brain um, and it was causing pressure effects. Um, these tumors are not difficult, but uh, challenging to take out because they're normally very, very sensitive nerves surrounding it. So, um, and damage to them or any trauma to them can give you a facial weakness or uh, problems which uh, cosmetically have uh, quite significant uh, problems. But she presented with loss of hearing and uh, tinnitus. Um, so again, it's a WHO grade one, so the likelihood of it recurring is very low. Uh, but uh, these patients also have the option of having radio surgery or targeted gamma knife um, if the, the, the tumors are smaller, which is a type of radiation. This is an interesting case. This is a nun that we had referred to us um, uh, who started um, behaving very abnormally in the convent. Um, she had personality changes, started stripping during uh, 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 certain times, and she significant personality changes referred her to the psychiatrist. And then uh, eventually with the, uh, the imaging, um, she was referred to us. And uh, it looked very unusual. It didn't look like a tumor to us. So uh, I carried out an uh, exploratory um, uh, um, operation and found out that it was an organized blood loss, which had been there and had turned into a sort of liquid status and was sitting there causing pressure effects. And post-operatively, uh, she's off all her, uh, by three months, she was off all her psychiatric medication. Um, this, is a, this is also, I think this is the last case um, that I want to discuss. This is also quite sad. Um, this is a young, uh, this is the abnormality here in the temporal lobe. This is a 40, 14 year old girl. Um, she was, she, they, they thought in, in Singhalese, Yaha Vahila. So they thought that this child was being possessed by uh, different demons and uh, was really um, abused by the family when she had these unusual seizures. What was happening, she was having unusual behaviors which lasted for a few seconds at which point she gets very agitated and uh, then she loses consciousness for a while. They sought uh, spiritual guidance for quite a while, but then uh, somebody somehow brought her to uh, the neurologist and she had a, a scan done and they were found to be atypical temporal lobe seizures. So she had a craniotomy, we took the whole thing out and it came back as a, a DNET, a type of uh, tumor which uh, children can get. Follow-up scans have all been fine. So post-operatively, just briefly, um, and I'll finish. Patient normally stays in ICU for 24, 48 hours. Awake craniotomies go straight to the ward. When the patient's transferred uh, to the ward, uh, we mobilize, I mobilize straight away as soon as the patient can get up. When they can go to the toilet, their uh, catheters are taken out. We continue the anti-epileptics under the guidance of the neurologists. I normally give three doses of antibiotics, maybe more if the, the, the whole procedure took more than 10 hours. Compression stockings, because if you've been immobile, 
for a while in theater, then you have an increased risk of uh, deep vein thrombosis. Generally, uh, we discharge when they're independent and mobile, and on average, that's about five days later. The patient's seen in clinic uh, in two weeks' time, mainly to review the wound and also to discuss the histology that will be available by that time and to discuss the further management and to re-refer or to refer on to the oncologist. So advances in surgery, as I mentioned, navigation systems, GPS systems. So if anybody's out there who wants to be a surgeon, it's easy now. Nerve monitoring, I use interoperative ultrasound, uh, more localization. Microscopes are becoming very fancy, so um, they're very good. 5-ALA, the drugs we give to highlight tumors and awake craniotomies. Molecular genetics has improved and also gives a huge impact as to how the patient will do um, after the surgery. So in summary, um, it's always individualized treatment for the patient because the future, um, in the future with unique uh, mapping, we, we can cater the, the treatment with regards to chemotherapy and radiotherapy according to their histology. Um, and in the pipeline, we have all sorts of magnetic devices, immune therapy, which may be uh, used in the future to um, prolong the life and the prognosis of these patients. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Dr. Abhay Parapta, for that very informative and interesting presentation with regards to the neurosurgical aspects regarding brain tumors. Now let me present uh, Dr. Sachini Malaviyarachi Rasmayaka, consultant, clinical oncologist for, for an oncological perspective on brain tumors. Thank you, um, Madam Runya Begunaratna and the team, Alanka Hospitals team, for inviting me to share my knowledge at this important forum. After you get your brain tumor out, where to go? Let's elaborate in flowing aspects. Metastatic brain tumors, meningiomas, certain glial tumors, and medulloblastomas. When it comes to metastatic brain tumors, the outcome of the further management if surgery done and what to do depends on how many metastases you have. So whether it's solitary brain metastasis or limited brain metastasis or whether it's extensive multiple brain metastasis. If it's solitary, we do treat with curative intent provided the primary is well under control and there are no other extracranial side disease. Surgery and stereotactic radiosurgery, that's focused radiation with high energy radiation therapy will give equal benefits. When it comes to limited brain metastasis, still we do offer surgery or stereotactic radiosurgery. That means again, we can offer high dose radiation therapy to those limited brain metastasis provided it is less than five or four and each less than four centimeters. When it comes to extensive brain metastasis, we do offer whole brain radiation therapy. Not only the th therapeutic decisions are made on, not only by the number of metastatic deposits, but also the prognosis, depending on the primary site, whether the patient's life expectancy is more than three months, or whether the patient has good prognostic tumors. For example, if it's breast, colorectal, they do live longer with systemic treatment. So we still can treat them with curative intent. So what to offer, whether it's whole brain radiation therapy or stereotactic radiosurgery plus whole brain radiotherapy. That again, depend on patients age and other comorbidities as well as the prognosis. Some do afraid to have whole brain radiation therapy, but you don't need to worry because when we offer whole brain radiation therapy, as you can see in this picture, that we do spare the limbic system and your memory or cognition will not impair. 
So the, uh, that is the beauty of the advanced technology we do call intensity modulated radiation therapy, IMRT, where we can spare all the vital structures while offering radiation therapy to risk areas. As you can see in this picture, that we do offer whole brain radiation therapy uh, with the required 30 gray to 40 gray while offering high dose, 60 to 70 gray to the metastatic deposits. That's what we do call, like we give tumor boost or tumor bed boost if it's surgically resected. And we, at the same time, can spare the vital structures. So we can spare the hippocampus. As you can see, the dose to the vital structures, like where the memory or the cognition memory and the emotions controlling areas will receive only 10% of the prescribed dose. We can offer for stereotactic radiation therapy to only the affected sites rather than offering a whole brain radiation therapy where in young patients, especially they do live longer, then they need not get long-term radiation side effects. As you can see in this chart, whole brain radiation therapy plus stereotactic radiosurgery versus stereotactic radiosurgery alone will never give the uh, outcome difference so that we can wait if it's limited metastasis in young patients, we do offer stereotactic radiosurgery alone and will never change the overall survival outcome. As you can see in this picture, the where this is the primary tumor. And once you offer stereotactic radiosurgery over 12 to 16 months, it's, the tumor has almost disappeared. Now let's talk about meningiomas. Meningiomas, when it's very low grade, we do even can observe. But when it comes to grade two or grade three, depending on risk factors, for example, either atypical or for these papillary rhabdoidal anaplastic, we do call them as malignant meningiomas, need radiation therapy if surgery is not possible or if there are residual diseases following surgery. As you can see in this picture, radiation therapy is important when the tumor located around vital structures like pituitary or uh, the, uh, close to optic chiasm. Here, the stereotactic radiation, radio surgery will give a very high dose to the tumor. While, like you can see, 27 gray to the primary tumor, while uh, the surrounding normal structures will receive only nine gray at the end of the radiation therapy. Not only for small meningiomas, we do offer radiation therapy to large tumors, still sparing the brain functions. And that is the beauty of intensity modulated radiation therapy. You can see very high dose to the tumor as well. While we can offer very low dose to the surrounding normal structures. So as you can see in this picture, the tumor is in red color, which received around 10% of the required dose, which is the total dose of 58 gray. While within five, within one centimeter or two, only 10% of the prescribed dose will receive to the rest of the normal brain tissue. And we can easily spare optic chiasms, the important nerves, pituitary and lens. So as you can see in this chart at the top, we do compare atypical meningiomas and malignant meningiomas, where with uh, the, when it's uh, overall survival and progression-free survival. Chart A shows the overall survival, whereas chart B is the progression-free survival. In both, you can see radiation therapy will give clear overall survival and progression-free survival benefits. Chart at the bottom, we compare the two groups with RT and without RT in malignant group and atypical group in both groups that we can see clear survival benefit, whereas the, uh, the survival is significant in malignant group compared to atypical group. 
Let's talk about glial tumors. When it's very low grade glial tumors like pilocytic astrocytoma, they are non-invasive, but very uncommon. And they considered as benign, potentially curable by surgery only. Radiation therapy required when surgery is not possible or the risk of recurrence and residual. When it comes to grade two glial tumors like oligodendroglioma or mixed glial tumors, we have to think of the overall prognostic factors such as age, if age is more than 40 years and tumor size is more than six centimeter, we do consider as unfavorable. As well as if the tumor is crossing the midline and presence of neurological deficit before resection, again, consider as unfavorable prognostic factors where they need radiation, adjuvant radiation therapy. Most importantly, the tumor genetics are very important in uh, the further adjuvant treatment decisions, including 1P19, Q coordination, and IDH, that is isocitrate dehydrogenase, which we, I will encounter in a few minutes. So when it comes to grade two glial tumors, if it's favorable after resection, we do can observe, or if it's unfavorable, definite benefit of adjuvant external beam radiation therapy with 45 to 54 gray plus, uh, if, uh, considering all the risk factors, they may beneficial with concurrent chemotherapy with temozolomide low dose during treatment plus adjuvant temozolomide high doses for six to eight cycles. When it comes to anaplastic gastrocytomas, behaves aggressive and surgery plus adjuvant chemotherapy and radiation therapy is mandatory. When it comes to adjuvant radiation therapy, it should be, it is highly likely depending on the tumor area, external beam radiation therapy, including IMRT, that is intensity modulated radiation therapy. What does that mean? That means like we do can modulate the intensity as you saw in previous slides, that we can give very high dose to the tumor, whereas we can preserve the normal brain structures. So uh, the after adjuvant radiation therapy, adjuvant mean post-operative, we do offer chemotherapy, which will be either alkylating agents, including temozolomide, or recently they have proven the PCV, that is procarbacy, uh, CCNU, and Winpristine have shown clear survival benefits over single agent, alkylating agents, which is temozolomide. When it comes to grade flu, four glial tumors, glioblastoma multiform, which necessarily required multidisciplinary approach, surgery, followed by radiation therapy and chemotherapy, still the prognosis is very poor. If we do not intervene, the prognosis is less than one year. But let's see how the interventions help, helps with stage four glial tumors. When, when these tumors have this uh, MGMT, that is methyl guanyl methyl transferase, which is a DNA repair enzyme that repairs damaged cells. So what will happen when the DNA is repaired? What we do with chemotherapy, we attack the DNA by using alkylating agents like temozolomide. So when temozolomide kills the damaged DNA in tumor cells, when this DNA repair gene is intact, they do repair and there will be resistance to the tumor. Once it's methylated and it's mutated, the response is very good because they do not they can't repair the damaged tumors and response will be very high that you can see in the right side charts where the MG, MGMT methylated, methylation is more than 10%, that there's clear survival benefit. Among females and males, the males do perform better than females. So when, when the tumor genetics have isocitrate dehydrogenase mutations, we do call IDH mutations, so that is very important in occurrence and development of glioma because when IDH mutations are there that produce high levels of 2 hydro hydroglutaric acid, which is the inhibit, which inhibits the stem cell differentiation. 
so which, which inhibits the, uh, the tumor further proliferation and differentiation and growth. So when uh, IDH mutations are there, the, uh, up, that, that further upregulate vascular endothelial growth factor. Those are very important in tumor formation and tumor microenvironment. Why this is important? Because we do can uh, treat them with anti-vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitors, which is a current practice for recurrent grade for, for gliomas. And these IDH mutations induce high level of hypoxia, induce factor alpha-1, which promote glioma invasion. So when the glial cells invades to surrounding normal structures, if this IDH mutation is there, the, we have a lot of options for those patients to treat. As you can see in this uh, chart, IDH mutated patients do better because we, we have a lot of options to treat them, whereas in IDH non-mutated or wild type do poor in a treatment response. So there are a lot of trials going on to treat recurrent brain tumor, brain flow for glial tumors including anti-angiogenic agents, where currently we do practice in Sri Lanka with bevacizumab and irinotecan, and we do offer thyrosine kinase inhibitors as well as pre-radiation with stereotactic radiosurgery to the recurred tumor area. Let's talk about pediatric brain tumors. Most common childhood brain tumor is medulloblastoma, where already you have uh, when gone through a very wide uh, knowledge on brain medulloblastomas. Let's see what can we do after resection of medulloblastoma. It will depend on patient's age. If the patient's age is less than three years, definitely we need to give chemotherapy in order to prevent recurrence. But if it's more than three years, they are benefited with craniospinal irradiation. What is this craniospinal irradiation? Craniospinal irradiation, I'll encounter in a few minutes. And apart from that, the tumor factors, tumor genetics are very important. Whether this tumor are grouped in according to tumor genetics, whether WNT group, established group, group three or group four, depending on the presence of different tumor genetics, the prognosis and patient's outcome differ. Especially if uh, the patients uh, low risk and non-metastatic survival is very good. They do respond to treatment very well and in certain instances we do see the survival is more than 95%. Once it's metastatic and they do, the tumor has MIC amplification. That's why these genetic studies are very important in brain tumors. So they, their prognosis is very poor and survival is less than 50%. That is why where we need craniospinal irradiation. Like not only at the brain, infracentipede, infratentorial area, this metalloblastoma can metastasize. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Eranga Ganeva has elaborated during his presentation. The metalloblastoma deposits in uh, along the CSF fluid flow, right? So that uh, you can see the deposits in spinal cord. That is the benefit. That is where, why we need whole brain as well as whole spine irradiation that we do call craniospinal irradiation. So what's, what's the difference between these two pictures? One is with conventional radiation. That is the radiation therapy methods we do practice in good old days. And this is helical tomotherapy where these facilities are available in most of the uh, advanced centers in Sri Lanka. So uh, as you can see in this picture, the green color is uh, areas receive around 60% of the treated dose. So then these children, most of them mind growing age, get their soft tissues irradiated unnecessarily with old methods of radiation. When you can see this comes to helical tomotherapy, only less than 30% of the unwanted area will irradiate while we do offer craniospinal radiation. Not only that, we have this dose volume histograms where we do 
check all the doses to the kidney, parotid, and all the risk organs before we commence radiation therapy. And what is the difference between these three? This, uh, this is 3D CRT, which is conventional radiation therapy, and IMRT is uh, more advanced than con conventional radiation therapy, where we can modulate the intensity. That is why intensity modulated radiation therapy comes. And then helical tome therapy further advanced. So, as you can see, the tumor 100% will receive the required dose is 35 to 40 gray, as well as the tumor dose distribution is equal, 0 to 100%. When it comes to the uh, olden techniques, the 100% will receive uh, 35 or prescribed dose, whereas certain points will receive very high doses, where we do call hotspots. So the dose distribution is very unique, and uh, the therapeutic index is very high when it comes to advanced radiation therapy. What if, if there are methods that we can 100% omit unnecessary radiation to the soft tissues. Are there any methods like this? Yes, we do have. This is the beauty of particulate radiation therapy where the proton treatment comes. So all these, you can see this unwanted soft, top, uh, soft tissue irradiation is minimal with this particulate radiation therapy. So the, that is the beauty of proton therapy where you can see this in the bottom pictures. Sorry about that. Uh, the tumor will receive 100% prescribed dose, whereas the surrounding normal structures receive very low dose. So the dose follow is very narrow. In current practice, or the, in, even in IMRT or helical tumor therapy, where at least 10% of prescribed dose will receive surrounding 5 to 10 centimeters around the tumor. As you can see in this picture, there they compare craniospinal irradiation at the time of diagnosis or craniospinal irradiation at the time of relapse. Invariably, craniospinal irradiation is beneficial. They do get overall survival benefits. And once it's irradiated at the beginning, the survival is longer compared to once uh, irradiated at relapse. However, when you compare no, not non-irradiation group with three-day irradiated group, survival is obviously better with irradiated group. So how do we give, what is the dose? These young group, young children with the growing age. So we do give total of 54 gray to the tumor, including 36 gray to the posterior cranial fossa plus spinal axis will receive 18 gray. And what are the chemotherapeutic agents we are including cisplatin etoposide combination or carboplatin etoposide combination will give significant overall survival benefit. As you can see in this picture, I told not only the age factors, the tumor genetics. So uh, the tumors with uh, favorable tumor genetics will respond very well. So their survival is better with uh, these two, group four and uh, WNT group, whereas the infants and adults not uh, perform well as well as the kids. So in summary, uh, we have already discussed how radiation therapy important in metastatic deposits and in meningiomas, most importantly in gliomas, uh, how radiation therapy and chemotherapy important and how tumor genetics play a role in management. And most importantly, in metalloblastomas in children, how radiation therapy and chemotherapy decisions made. Thank you and hope to meet you again in discussion. So just to, just to uh, thank you, Satini. Thank you, Satini. That was very, very informative. Um, thank you for being here as well. And I would like to thank all the speakers as well today. Um, I've been trying to answer questions as we go along. So I think the best thing would be um, if there are any questions at all that you could address them um, to us or let us know, email us, and we'll be happy to uh, accommodate you.
and we'll try and make the presentations available for you as well. I think there's been a few requests from the medical students who have been uh, um, participating. So I'd like to hand over to Dr. Jeevana now, uh, just to bring the session to an end um, and uh, to go through some details with you. Thank you, Dr. Abhigunratna. <clears throat> On behalf of Lark Hospitals, let me thank Dr. Vini Abhigunratna, Dr. Sachini Manivyarachi, Dr. Srikant Srinivasan, and Dr. Rangika Nevatta for this very informative forum. Also, I would like to thank each and every person who zoomed in to this webinar. If you do have any further queries, you may visit our website on www.larkhospitals.com forward slash neurosurgery and a free downloadable copy of Dr. Rooney Abekunaratna's handbook uh, themed uh, brain tumors a patient <clears throat> guide is available for download from our website also you'll be seeing a slide with contact informations regard uh, and you're free to contact us on email or by dialing the following numbers for further information. Now you will be able to see a short video clip regarding Lanka hospitals. Thank you. Are you Bovan and welcome to Sri Lanka, where we believe that health is wealth. Following our country's ethos of health and happiness and believing in offering you nothing but the best, we are Lanka Hospitals. Arrive at the Bandaranaike International Airport and be transported or airlifted to Lanka Hospitals, located just a few kilometers away. We are a multi-specialty hospital that combines state-of-the-art facilities with cutting-edge technology, skillfully guided by a team of experienced and well-trained experts. Our Blood Cancer Center offers comprehensive diagnostic and treatment facilities for all blood-related disorders, including chemotherapy and bone marrow transplant and many more. Our Heart Center is dedicated to offering comprehensive cardiac and cardiothoracic procedures and we have conducted over 7,500 surgical procedures with excellent results. Making the miracle of parenthood a reality is our Fertility Center offering a wide array of fertility procedures, guiding and assisting you through conception, pregnancy and delivery. Our Women's Wellness Centre is equipped with everything you need, from pap smear tests to digital mammography, providing consultation, diagnostics, treatment and guidance. By far the most impressive in Sri Lanka, our radiology and imaging department comes equipped with the latest neuroimaging MRI3 Tesla, CT and ultrasound scanners to offer nuclear medicine for diagnostic, therapeutic and preventive care. Headed by an expert team of gastroenterologists and gastrointestinal surgeons, our gastroenterology department provides specialized diagnostics and treatment of all gastrointestinal and hepatitis disorders. Our fully equipped surgical unit comprises surgical ICU and high dependency unit with state-of-the-art facilities and is on par with renowned surgical centers in the world. We have a range of other specialized departments as well such as Neurosciences, ENT, Kidney Care Center, Eye Clinic, Dental Clinic, Cosmetic Clinic, Diabetic Clinic, Men's Wellness Center and Health Clinic. Lanka Hospitals. We are there 24 hours a day, 7 days a week to help you be your best self. Welcome to the ultimate health and wellness journey in Sri Lanka. Capable people with unparalleled experience providing extraordinary health care. Lanka Hospitals. Caring. Curing.